Good morning. My name is Janice Lilly, and this morning's scripture reading is Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. You can find it on page 75 in the Bible in the pew in front of you. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. This is God's word. Well, next week, I'll launch our new sermon series um, in the Gospel of John. We haven't announced that yet, but announcing it now. We won't finish the series in the summer, but we do hope to make it through four chapters. (laughs) They're very full chapters. They're very, very full chapters. As for our current series, as Ben said a moment ago, the series we called The Gospel According to Exodus... Some nine months after we began, today we come to the 27th and final sermon in the book. And I hope, I hope it will be as encouraging to you to hear as it was to me to write. And speaking of encouragement, with, without any apologies, my aim this morning is to pour into you as much biblical encouragement as God will give us. We've done the hard work these nine months. We have preached extensively about our slavery to sin and our need for rescue from God's punishment. We've preached for hours about the law of God and our failure to keep it. We've preached about our idolatry. That is the way our hearts tend to want to put other gods before the real God and how we've taken the real God and want to bring him down and change him into our image. We've preached about all of that. But now, again, I just want to lay on encouragement to lay on the gospel according to Exodus. You've never met someone too encouraged. You've never met someone who says, I'm full of all the encouragement I can handle. I heard a sermon the other week about the love of God for sinners, and then someone said, I have nice shoes. I'm good. Like I've got all the encouragement I could ever need. Says no one. And even if we were filled with all the encouragement we could handle, you leak. Gospel encouragement tends to leak from us. Some of us faster than others. On May 25th, May 25th, 1961, so almost to the day, 61 years ago, President Kennedy stood before Congress and proposed that the United States should, quote, commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of, some of you will know where this is going, landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to earth. Both are important. (laughs) Kennedy would die before it would happen. In fact, just a few years after that speech. But it did happen. A Saturn V rocket launched astronauts into space in July of 1969. And a few days later, July 21st specifically, men walked on the moon. It's an extraordinary thing. And then a few days after that, they all returned. And if you're in your mid to late 60s, you would have been young when it happened, but you might remember Kennedy's speech. If you're your mid to late 50s, you might remember the one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. I I don't know a tenth of the challenges that face the United States in carrying out Kennedy's commitment, but I do know the 60s, the 1960s, were a time of great upheaval. There were wars and rumors of war, protests, the sexual revolution, hate crimes, race-based violence and murders, just to name a few of the challenges. And from my understanding, limited as it is, it seems like there would have been plenty of reasons to quit and fail. It's a poor representation, but in some ways it, the Kennedy speech, 
the decade to the moon and back, it, it can help us understand the book of Exodus. We read the service in the verse, or in the service we already read the verse, chapter 3, verse 12, but I want to read it again. Through a fiery bush that doesn't burn, God speaks to Moses and says, I will be with you. I will be with you, God says, and this will be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. You shall serve God on this mountain, he says. When God tells that to Moses, Moses isn't even in Egypt. He's in the wilderness, and the two million of God's people are in Egypt. And oh, by the way, they're enslaved by the most powerful man of the most powerful nation on earth. Challenges. But then Moses comes back to Egypt. God sends plagues and the Israelites leave. To summarize 10 chapters. And when they leave, God declares it to be for them the first day of the new year. Exodus 12, verse 2. This day is the beginning of years for you. It's New Year's Day, first year. Then three months later, they come to This mountain, this Sinai mountain, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. And then they stay there at the base of this mountain for nine months. So day one, three months, get to the mountain, then nine months. And at the end of that nine months is the first day of the second year. Exodus chapter 40, verse 2 and verse 17. And they're there for nine months, building all that will be built for the God who is who he is. If you remember, I mentioned a couple weeks ago in a sermon about all the building that would take place. I said, you couldn't have done this in an all-nighter right before the end of a semester. Like, you couldn't have. They took nine months to do all of this building. But then when nine months are over, the first day of the second year, God's word to Moses from Exodus chapter 3, verse 12 comes true. Not only, not only has God brought them to himself, bearing them on eagle's wings, taking them out of the strong hand of Egypt so that they might worship him on this mountain, but God also brings his presence to them. He brings them out so he can come close. And he does this so that they would know that God is God. That's the phrase we've come back to again and again, isn't it? Throughout the book of Exodus, a phrase so often repeated, so weighty and so prominent, theologians have given it the name, the recognition formula. And the recognition formula, as I've said probably a half dozen times across this series, goes like this. Then he will know. Then they will know. Then you will know. Then you will know what? What will we know? Then you will know, God says, that I am God. The recognition formula occurs nearly 20 times in the book. Everything that God does in the book of Exodus is so that you would recognize that God is God. All of the events in Exodus, from the baby floated down the river, to a fiery bush that doesn't burn, to Moses and the plagues and the the angel of death passing over the doors that had the lamb's blood on them, to the parting of the Red Sea, to the closing of the Red Sea, to the manna on the ground, to the pillar of fire, to the giving of the law, to the building of all that would be built for the proper worship of the God who is who he is. All of that was done so that you would know God is God. And it wasn't. It wasn't just, as we've pointed out recently, that God had to save his people from Egypt. It wasn't just that. God must save Israelites from Israelites. For the last two weeks, we talked about the debacle that was the golden calf. And now, after chapters 32 and 33 and 34, the people have this renewed sense of obedience, a willingness to respond to God's grace. And and we didn't read this passage today, but we see their obedience highlighted in all kinds of ways from chapter 35 all the way through the end of the book to chapter 40. They bring offerings of gold for the Ark of the Covenant. They bring offerings for the material for the tabernacle, fine linen garments for the priests. They bring offerings for all that had to be made, so much so that Moses actually has to say, you got, you got to stop bringing stuff. We have plenty of stuff. If you haven't brought it yet, you missed your chance. And after they bring the material, they build it all. And at the end of nine months, Moses instructs 
them to have it all assembled. In fact, God tells Moses to assemble it all. Then Moses has them assemble it all. And they do everything word for word as the Lord commanded. That's the phrase. If we had read all of chapter 40, that's the phrase we would have seen over and over again in chapter 40. As the Lord commanded, as the Lord commanded, as the Lord commanded. Seven times in the chapter, 19, 21, 23, 25, 27, and 32. As the Lord commanded. And when they finish, God shows up. Let's look at the passage again. Chapter 40, verse... Actually going to begin just at the last few phrases in 33 and then read through the end of the book. Chapter 40, beginning in the end of verse 33. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled their tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys... Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of God would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. As we finish Exodus, you might have the same feeling you have as you watch a season of a show. <laughs> you come to the end and you think, I think they're setting me up for a sequel. <laughs> right? Exodus has set you up for a sequel. Leviticus and Numbers, and if we followed the line of that sequel, it would make it a different sort of sermon. But, but I do want to focus on the imagery that is here before us. Smoke and fire and the cloud of glory of the Lord. That It, it, it makes me think, from that illustration at the beginning about Kennedy and, and, and the mission to the moon, it makes me think of this metaphor of a Saturn V rocket is a good one. After months of preparation, the rockets assembled on the launch pad, the astronauts climb aboard the rocket. And then there's, so there's T minus nine months, there's T minus nine weeks, nine days, nine minutes, and then the seconds, right? Everything's shaking. Maybe some of you have been and you've seen Cape Canaveral, and like you've seen the smoke billow up and this rocket goes, right? Except in Exodus, God comes down. God comes down. The smoke and the fire. One scholar writes, there is no break between verses 33 and 34. We could easily translate, no sooner had Moses finished the work, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It's as if, writes this scholar, God could not wait to be where he had wanted to be all along in the midst of his people. There are lots of things you can't wait for. Maybe you can't wait for school to get out. There's a few of you thinking that. For others, you can't wait to graduate. For others, you can't wait to go on vacation. You can't wait to retire. It seems that with even greater expectation, God was eager to come down to his people. Do you know God's eagerness? You should. The story of Jesus coming to earth is the outworking of God's eagerness. And the people do want to be near him. A few years ago, you remember how excited Harrisburg was? Some of you wouldn't have noticed this, but some of you did. When we, the thought was Amazon was coming to town. They were going to build some of their headquarters here in town, and there was this buzz around Harrisburg about the blessing that it would be to have Amazon. Here, the God of the universe who has brought them out of Egypt, the God who loves them, is among them. And there's something picturesque about it, too, even the way it's written. God is dwelling among them. We read, where they go, he goes. Where, where he goes, they go. It's as if it were meant to be. Because it is. The dwelling of God among them is a reality they could have never imagined accomplishing apart from God. As we close the book, we need to see the encouragement that Exodus offers. We have more than an academic interest in this book. We have a personal interest, or we should have a personal interest. The same God who delivered them and dwelled with them is the same God who delivers us and dwells with us. 
And the encouragement from the book of Exodus is that God can do what he says. He told Moses, you will worship me on this mountain. And they do. All the obstacles that were against them, from the outside, from the inside, could not stop God from keeping his promises and dwelling among them. And it makes me think, it makes me think of the way older saints describe God and their Christian life. Yeah, an older, mature Christian might say, yeah, yeah, I did some things. I served in my church. I was faithful to God in my singleness. I even led a few people to the Lord. Ran an honorable business. Yeah, yeah, I did all that. I did that. But, they say, but, my story is that God carried me. If you knew, they say, if you knew the sin and the struggles, if you knew the setbacks, if you knew the times I wanted to quit, indeed did quit, if you knew the times that the Lord had to resurrect me, if you knew all this, then you would know that my story is not about what I did for God, but what God did for me. The Lord is merciful and gracious, they say, slow to anger, bounding in steadfast love and faith. That's how older saints talk. That's how the people of Exodus talk. That's how we should talk. That's how, if you're a Christian, you will talk by the grace of God. Because the God of Exodus is the same God who promised in the New Testament, I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Those are words of Jesus to his disciples. And they remind me of Exodus 3.12. You will worship me on this mountain. I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. That's a promise from Jesus. You, know, you might feel like your life is going to hell. You, you might even say, I feel like my soul is going to hell. And you might feel that way because it's true. Hell is a real place. And outside of Jesus, that's where sin leads. And you need Jesus. You need his forgiveness. You need his redemption. You need his rescue. You need his mercy. You need his life, his death, his resurrection, the promise of his second coming. And you've never received it, but you can today. Like You, you, can, you can get in on all that today. Some of you might feel like your life is going to hell, and you're not. You're not. Your life's just really hard. And, and I don't know one-tenth of the struggles, but you do. And your life's hard because of the sin around you. It might be hard because of the sin within you. And it might just be hard right now for some of you because you're doing really, really, really good things for the glory of God, and Satan hates that. And you need to hear, really, really all of us need to hear as we close, that God loves you too. You need to hear that God's not done with you, and he never will be. He will build his church and that includes you if you are in his church, which is to say, if you are in Jesus, if you are in a relationship with God through faith in Christ, be encouraged that the gospel according to Exodus is the gospel according to the Bible. And it's for you. It's for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's not a one among us who's so full of encouragement. We just say, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> I, I have all the encouragement I can handle. Lord, we leak gospel encouragement. I leak gospel encouragement. And so we come again as beggars, asking for you to fill us. Not because we deserve it, 
Not because we've earned it, but because you are good and you are kind. And we believe in the scriptures and the testimony of our life that you love us. And we ask, Lord, that you would carry us home to the promised land and finish the good work you have begun. We pray this in Christ's name.